name is Sarah Cosgriff and I was a researcher at the University of Warwick and I used to study how cells move which is um, important for understanding metastasis and cancer and now I'm a freelance science communicator so this is actually one of my favourite things to do, to speak and um, to whoever's new here to Cafe Scientific, I'm new too I guess. Um, what I want to talk about tonight is this lady here, Henrietta Lacks and it's because of her I was able to do my research when I was at the University of Warwick. She is the reason we have many things such as blood typing, we have the vaccine for polio, we know that we have 23 pairs of chromosomes, we know so much thanks to her, and she's even been to space, which is something that very few people would actually be able to claim within their lifetime. The very sad thing about this is that she will never know this, because this picture was taken in 1950-ish, and she died in 1951, aged 31 years old, of cervical cancer five children behind and a husband. It was a really terrible cancer. When she was diagnosed in the John Hopkins Hospital in Virginia, they found a tumour which they actually suspected may not be there three months before. It was about the size of a nickel. And it was very aggressive, took over and caused her a lot of pain. But because of how aggressive it was and how quickly it grew, she was able to give something wonderful to the world. You see, while she was being treated in the hospital, a researcher called George Guy took some of her cells without permission and brought them to his lab. Now George Guy has been trying to grow, at this point, for the last 30 years, trying to grow an immortal human cell line. Be able to grow human cells in a dish that would li live forever, basically. And he tried, he tried using different kinds of cells from different kinds of patients that came to the hospital, particularly cancer cells, because it was his belief that if you can grow a cancer cell in a dish, you find a cure for cancer. And what happened is that he gave them to his lab assistant, who was very sceptical because he's been trying to grow them for the last 30 years. But then they survived. But they didn't just survive, they grew like a weed. They would double their population within 24 hours. It was on an astounding scale. And they called it the healer cell after Henrietta Lacks. And this is meant to preserve, um, basically, to keep her anonymous, but of course we know her name. And this was a very big breakthrough, and as I said, George Guy thought this would be the, the way to find the cure for cancer. But as you see, we're sitting here six years later, her cells have been used all around the world, but it still doesn't mean, it's, it doesn't mean that we have the cure for cancer now. It's a little bit like a human genome project, in that when they were started with the project, they thought, right, we're going to find the whole code, it'll be amazing, we'll find, we'll just be able to tackle so many medical problems. But, as we found more and more about the genome, we actually had more questions. And that's the sort of same thing. In fact, did you know that today is the 10th anniversary of the completion of the Human Genome Project? Absolutely amazing. It's also absolutely amazing how much we have achieved in just the last 10 years after knowing the human genome, what we know about the human genome. And we've been able to achieve so much in the last six years thanks to the healer cell. But why was it so difficult? Why was this such a big thing? I mean, we've been able to use microscopes and see cells and use the microscopes for at least two or three centuries before this point. Why was this so difficult to try and grow a cell outside of the human? And to answer that question, I would like to ask for a volunteer from the audience. And I promise you, one glass of white wine. If that's, uh, <laughs> if that's the way of buying you in. Any hands up? Oh, hello. Yes, please come forward. I think it's now. Here we go. I think it's now. <laughs> hello, my name's Andy Stewart. Andy Stewart. Uh, can I just go with Andy? No so, problem. Uh, and um, how do you feel being in front of an audience? Are you quite comfortable, uncomfortable? I'm, I'm not very comfortable. You're not very no, comfortable. No, no, no. Right, right. Okay, I'll see what I can do about that. Can I take a seat? And uh, there is a glass of white wine, I promise you. I don't make false promises to get some on the stage. Um, does that make you feel a bit more relaxing down somewhat? Yes, yes, yes I'm less of a... But it's not, it's not the same, is it? You've been brought out here to where the audience, the whole audience is now able to view rather than being part of it yourself. And even though I'm sort of being sat down, you have a drink, you're comfortable, it's not the same feeling, is it? No. And it's exactly the same as trying to culture a cell outside of a human. You can sit down now if you wish. Thank <laughs> 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 you.
So it is so difficult to try and replicate the exact conditions inside a tissue. A cells are usually basically all in with other cells. You have cell signals from other cells next to you. You need the right nutrients, you need the right temperature. When we grow cells in our lab, we even have to consider things. When we have the incubator, we have the, the body temperature, which is 37 degrees, but we also have to even consider something like carbon dioxide percentage. Because when your oxygen reaches your tissues from the bloodstream, uh, there's an exchange of carbon dioxide and oxygen, and therefore we have to take into consideration that level of carbon dioxide, you have to consider that there's a level of carbon dioxide actually there. So when I used to culture my cells, which came from my eye, well, well our eyes, um, you have the level of carbon dioxide for that in an incubator would actually be lower than what was required for the healer cells, which were grown in the same lab that I used to work in, because you have quite a bit of oxygen in your eye. So you have to consider the tiny, tiny things. And we do a really good job of it, although it's not 100%, but it's, I mean, it's amazing that we've been able to come so far anyway and grow them anyway. Um, why is a healer cell so good at growing? We don't really know is the, is the answer to that. We do know it is down to its particular genetic mutations that make it what, it what it is. They managed to replicate the same genetic mutations in cervical cells in Japan. They love Japan. And it had the same behaviour as the healer cells that came from Henrietta originally. The other thing we know is that it's immortal. And it's just like this is a characteristic that other cancer cells have. Well, I can actually pass on the immortality secret to you now. Would you like to hear it? <laughs> All right, so imagine this pencil is your DNA. And every time you cell divides, you need to duplicate this DNA. So you have two new lots of DNA and two new cells. But whenever you do that, it actually shortens the DNA. And that's not a good thing. Because imagine if you had the entire works of Harry Potter and you chuck out a couple of books. You're removing information, and that's not right. So, what cells have is a trick. This is a cap, and this cap is called um, a telomere. However, this gets shortened too, and over time, it'll get shorter and shorter and shorter <coughs> until you don't have any left. That cell is no longer able to divide, and it will die. And this is actually, I would say, a, rest a restricting factor. It's actually part of your aging. You're not meant to live forever, and this is a way of sort of capping that. But what cancer cells have is an enzyme called telomerase, and this actually adds on to the end of this cap, so this cap will never completely degrade away. And therefore, this cap will go on and on and on forever, and the cells can divide as many times as it likes. It's something I wouldn't want to recommend, though. There's a reason why. You're not really meant to live forever, and cells aren't meant to live forever. And cancer cells, the longer they live, the more they're likely to get more mutations and more mutations and more mutations. Interestingly enough, uh, about half the people in this room do actually have high levels of telomerase in one type of cell. Could you guess what that is? Female. Sorry? Male or female? Male. That's right. The men in this room have uh, levels of telomerase in their sperm. So basically you have a mortal sperm. So there's a fact there for you. Um, <laughs> um, so we know that they're very good at growing as well and duplicating, which is very similar to a weed. Now what's a weed good at? <coughs> Weeds are incredibly good at taking over gardens. And this is what healer cells did. Healer cells started contaminating other cell cultures. So since the healer cells discovered, different cell lines were produced such as liver cells, eye cells, all different kinds. And in 1966, a man called Stanley Gartler said at a conference, I think the healer cells are taking over our cell lines. If he was right, this would be binning a lot of research that had been done. You could be binning months or years of research. So for example, if a researcher was working on liver cells, looking at something that would only happen in liver cells, but in fact he was actually working with healer cells, which were cervical cells, then his research was completely wrong. And actually because of that, he had a, um, Stanley actually had a lot of resistance from the scientists at the time. Because that, that was a huge thing to say. And this was a man that was not very well known either. So he went about to try and prove it. And this would mean going back to Henrietta's family. Now Henrietta never gave permission for her tissue to be taken. And her family never knew that it was taken. So imagine a man, 15 years after your mother's died, turns up at your doorstep and said, May I have some blood samples? 
or it's for the research about your mother, or oh, by the way, your mother is being grown in labs all over the world. It's quite a shocking thing to hear, and especially with the family who are quite religious, so the youngest daughter, Deborah, actually believed, her belief was that these cells, because they came from her mother, they were harming her mother from the grave, and that they were doing atom bomb testing, they were taking them to space, they were doing all sorts of things with her mother's <coughs> cells, and it was quite, it was quite a hard thing to take in. And the reason why they were taking blood samples was to figure out whether those uh, cell cultures were being contaminated by cells. But the family thought that they were actually being tested for the same cancer. So things weren't very well explained then. I'll actually talk about, about that a bit later. But because of this, he actually figured out, yes, these cell cultures were being contaminated. And because of that, we have very good cell culture practice today. And this, this is me when I was a scientist, basically. Uh, and this is in the cell culture room, which is a separate room from the rest of the lab. Uh, this is what you call um, a hood. So it's a, meant to be a very sterile space. You make sure you, when, whenever I used to set up everything, I would wipe things down, I'd use certain techniques, I would make sure that I'd be completely covered up. And you're not just protecting your, um, your cultures from bacteria and stuff like that, you're also protecting cells from other cells. So we got, grow them, used to grow them up in what we call medium, which is a liquid which is full of the nutrients, but it also contained antibiotics for the two reasons. One being protecting from microorganisms, and the other protecting from other cells. You see, what you can do is you can insert what you call plasmid, which is a little genetic, basically a ring made of genetic material. You put that into a cell, and if you tell that little genetic material is telling that cell to be resistant against a particular antibiotic. So if you add a particular antibiotic to your, to your medium, it will select for only your cells and your cells only, and also kill anything else in it, including cells or you could have, so human cells, or you could have bacteria that in there as well. So we've developed really good cell culture practice because of that, although you have to make sure you do this well because you can still contaminate things. I've been talking about these healer cells for quite a while. Why not actually show you some? This movie I'm about to show you was given to me by James Bancroft and Dr. Andrew McCain from the CMCB lab uh, at the University of Warwick. And this is them. So these are HeLa cells that they use uh, to study mitosis. And mitosis is cell division. And what we've got here in the green is uh, chromosomes and the red is your cytoplasm. And what you might notice is that you get the, the green becomes very, very bright and sort of lines up and you have red on either side and it splits. And basically what's happening is that it lines up the chromosomes and just during the metaphase phase of mitosis and then brings them apart and you've got two new sets of DNA in two new cells. And what might happen in cancer cells is they start to lag behind when they get pulled apart and sometimes you actually find with healer cells, they have an abnormal number of chromosomes in comparison to a normal human cell. So, the reason why I wanted to show you this is that I really remember my first time when I studied, started studying cell migration. The first time I saw cells under the microscope. It was really exciting. And to see something that's real and something that's, seeing something's behaviour, rather than reading a printout of the machine, is just, to me, really, really exciting. So, one of the first... Um, things that we were able to do with HeLa cells was the polio vaccine. In 1951, there was a huge epidemic to the point that schools were closing. In 1952, a researcher called Jonas Salk was able to provide the answer. However, it needed to be tested and tested well, but safely as well. So we able to use HeLa cells in order to do this. You see, because HeLa cells reproduce very quickly, so doubling its population within 24 hours, um, you're able to grow the viruses inside them. You see, viruses, in order to replicate themselves, they need our cells, our cell machinery, in order to reproduce themselves. Think of it as kind of a factory line of proteins that you then put together as stealing our senior, machinery in order to do that. And that's how he was able to test and produce a vaccine, and I think he won a Nobel Prize for it as well. And that was one of the first great things he was, you were able to do with healer cells and led on to so many things afterwards. It's thanks to George Guy who actually, he didn't paint any cells even if he could. His, his sort of way of thinking was he wanted to give up the cells to as many researchers as possible to do many great things. And he wasn't really interested in having money. He was very much about sort of advancement of research, advancement of mankind in that way. Which is, um, I, to me, is what I would call a true researcher, to me. 
Now finally, I would like to end the talk, this talk, on the ethics of this. So Henrietta was never told, was never given, she never gave permission to give herself. But now knowing everything I've just told you, and there's so much more to read about as well, would you have given Henrietta, would, would you have asked Henrietta for permission in 1951 for her tissue? Knowing that she could say no, especially if she feels that it wasn't explained to her very well. But for all we know, she might have said yes, and it would have been fine, and we would still have this today. And recently, uh, a paper came out, um, a, bit, a piece of research came out, in which a group sequenced the HeLa cell genome. And to scientists, we see that as, well, it's very useful because we use HeLa cells a lot in research, do many things with it, that sequence will be very useful. But to the family, because her genetics are similar to their genetics, it's saying something it's related to them, it's not, it's a sort of invasion of their privacy. But then for the last 60 years we've been doing research on HeLa cells. Do we have to go to the family every time we want permission for publishing, publishing research about HeLa cells? It's, it's tricky, isn't it? Because the problem with this is that usually the patient would be anonymous. But the problem is with this is that Henrietta's name somehow got out. We're not really sure how. It could be as simple as some documents were left and some journalists read them, they, the, because the hospital never really released it. In fact, for several, several years, her name was known as Heaven Lane, rather than Henrietta Lacks. But at the same time, I'm really glad I actually know the story about Henrietta Lacks. I was talking to a relative research, re recently about this story, and only as soon as I mentioned Healer did she say, oh yes, I work on those, and she had no idea who this woman was. She just saw it as some cell she works on every day. And I'm glad to know the story because I, like, I know who to thank when it comes to cell culture research. I'd like to thank her for allowing me to do the research that I've been able to do, but also thank her for being able to give us so much medical research and saving millions of lives and potentially <coughs> so much more to come. And finally, I'd actually like to say thank you for listening to me, and thank you for finding it interesting enough to come to listen to. So, and also thank you, Kathy's ITV people, to allow me to talk. Thank you.